All right, so for today's lesson, we're going to be taking a step back from the actual programming and taking a look at the programming process. In other words, the steps we have to follow in order to create a fully functional program. So if you remember from last year's course, the programming process is broken down into five distinct stages. The first stage is defining the problem, then we have planning the solution, coding the program, testing the program, and then finally documenting the program, which happens throughout the four previous stages. So we look a little more closely at defining the problem. In this stage, we need to start figuring out how we're going to actually organize our program. Or more specifically, what classes are we going to have to have in order to make our program function? Because as we started to see already, the programs we're going to be creating from this point forward are going to be much more complex than the ones we've done in the past, and are going to require a variety of classes in order to work. So once we know what classes we have, we have to start looking more closely and say what attributes do each class have? What services are going to be provided by each of our classes? And then also on top of that, how are those classes going to relate with each other? Is there going to be some inheritance where one class inherits from another? Or are objects from one class going to be required to be attributes for another class? So we do this by creating what's called a class diagram. So you create a table and at the top of the table you put the name of the class that you're working with. And then in the, sec in the second little box, you're going to list all the attributes that that particular class is going to have. So for example, if I was going to use the robot class, I'd have to provide the fact that it's got an integer uh, attribute, which is going to be its street. It'd have an integer for an avenue. It'd have a direction, which we're going to call a direction. And I might also even put a little brief one-line description of each of those attributes as well. And then in the final box, I'm going to list all the services that are going to be provided by that particular class. So again, this is just a sampling, but for the robot class, I'd have its constructor, and then all the parameters that are going to be required to make that constructor run. I'd have all of its uh, services as well, like the move method, right? In this case, there would be no parameters. I might have the turn left method, uh, get, get uh, intersection, all that kind of stuff that I might have as part of a, a robot class. And then you can start showing the relationship between each of the classes that you've created by using arrows. If you use a fully enclosed arrow like this, that represents that something is going to inherit from another class. So in other words, this class is a something else. If I use an open-ended arrow, that shows that they are related to each other. So for example, uh, one class has a object of another class. So we can see what this would look like here in an example of inheritance. I'd have my robot class with all of its uh, attributes and services. Obviously, again, there would be more of those in those various boxes. And then I have the Superbot class that we created. Um, and you'll notice that there are no new attributes for this class. All the attributes of the Superbot come from the inherited attributes of the Robot class. We can see here that the Superbot is a example of a robot. And then all we list here is the new services that we have added to in the inherited uh, subclass. If we want to show how something's related, we can look at our lamp example from our previous lesson. And we have a lamp class that has um, an attribute of the icon and then various methods that we created to make our lamp function. And it has a lamp icon object. So you can see here the lamp icon relates to the actual lamp icon class and then we can put all of the attributes and services provided by that lamp icon class. Once we've finished planning out all the classes that we require, we can start actually starting to come up with algorithms for each one of the methods in those classes. Okay? We can do that using either a flowchart, which is a visual representation of the flow of the program, or pseudocode, which has again has logic structure but no command syntax. And if you've forgotten from previous years what those look like, here's an example. In the flowcharts, we have some different symbols that we could use. So we've got the oval representing the starting and ending of a particular method. We have arrows to represent the direction of flow. We have rectangles representing a process or some sort of command um, that we might run. Uh, we've got a parallelogram, which represents any kind of input-output interaction with the user. We have a diamond representing a decision, which would have multiple arrows leading off of it, depending on the, uh, the answer to that decision. If we need to connect to a different area of our page, we can use a circle with a little number inside and then another circle with a number inside to show where we would connect to. And if we go to another page, we use this little flag symbol here. Again, we put a number inside of it, and then on the next page, we put that same symbol with a number inside of it showing where we start from. So here's an example. 
of a program that inputs a set of numbers and outputs their average. So obviously first we need to start, then we need to input our number. We see if we have another number, if so we repeat. So here's a decision structure leading to a repetition structure here and we keep repeating until we no longer need another number in which case we take this branch of our decision structure and we go to calculate our average output the result and finally end that particular method and we can see the same code if we're using pseudocode so we'll look at the same example here and remember that we cannot use language specific terminology this this pseudocode should be able to be applied to any programming language so again the same problem where we're going to input a set of numbers and output their average so we input a number, we add that number to our total, we input if there's going to be more numbers or not, and then we set up our loop. While there are more numbers to be input, we input another number, add it to our total, ask if there's more numbers to be input, and then loop. So all this stuff that's been indented here would repeat over and over again until the answer to this question is no, there are no more numbers, in which case we exit out of that loop and output our total. Once the planning has been completed for each of our methods, we can start actually translating those algorithms into the formal programming languages. And again, there's a whole variety of different languages we could use, and obviously in this course, we've been working with Java. Once you've done that, and sometimes as you're writing your code, you'll start to test your program. And there are two different ways you can do that. One is through the use of the compiler. So every time we try and compile our code, essentially what we're doing is we're translating them from the source code that we've written into binary code, specifically in Java programs, that the computer can understand. So this would be translated into the zeros and ones that computers work with. During this process, the compiler is going to detect any syntax errors. These are errors in the way that the code is written. So for example, I'm missing a semicolon, or I've got the wrong kind of bracket, or I'm trying to use a variable that hasn't been given a value yet. All those kinds of things that would actually make our program crash or not be able to compile properly. Once our program is fully written and functioning, we can start debugging it. And this is going to detect our logic errors. So what we're going to do is we're going to run our program with a variety of different test case scenarios representing a variety of different situations, probably uh, extremes and some random um, values in between. And we're going to try and make sure that all of that program results exactly the way that we want it to. So we're going to get the exact results that we were predicting that we were going to get. And if you get inconsistent results, you need to go back and revamp your algorithms or your code. And then as I said, the final stage isn't really the final stage. This actually happens throughout the entire uh, process, throughout the entire development cycle. And what we're going to do is develop any kind of documentation that we require. So in the beginning planning stages, we have to create all of our class diagrams, which will be extremely important in working with groups so that you can sort of pass off a few classes to one program and another few classes to another program and they can create their programs and their classes knowing what the requirements for the other classes are that they're going to be uh, used with. We've got the algorithms being created. We are going to create Java docs or for all of the internal documentation of our programs so therefore if by chance we get fired or promoted or whatever and someone else has to look at our code they'll be able to understand it. Uh, finally, we need to document all of our testing procedures. We need to create any kind of help menus within our programs and any kind of user manual that might be required to make our program run as well. So these are all things that have to be documented and written up throughout the entire life cycle of the program. That's it. We'll see you tomorrow in class where we can continue on with some of our programming lessons.